Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. So today we are going to go through this article by Paul Romer, uh, which is very, very, very strongly critical of modern macroeconomics. In response to this, many people have written very hostile counter arguments. But one of the main things is that they say that well, however macro is, you are part of the people who shaped it, so you can't just blame others for it. And this is actually partly true. But it doesn't matter, and if somebody made a mistake, he should be allowed to repent. So, so um, part of the reason that I'm going through this, and I, I will take one more lecture, inshallah, on this material uh, before we go on to modern modern monetary. That is that you should be familiar with the conventional macro, not from the inside as it is taught in graduate schools, where you learn how actually to do the things and understand, but from the outside as knowing what the terminology is. It's just like learning how to drive a car. Is relative. You should be able to know how to use the conventional standard macro concepts without necessarily understanding very deeply about the theory that goes into making them. So anyway, uh, the article by Romer starts by saying that macro has been going backwards for three decades. So to um, personally, I was in graduate school in from 74 to 77 in uh, Stanford and we were studying macro at that time Keynesian economics was the dominant school of thought and Chicago school was not considered respectable but um, around that time the revolution was launched with careful planning and it was uh, organized along many different dimensions and the details are uh, given in this article called Winning Ideas by al and Foster. So this revolution was amazingly successful. Keynesian economics was driven out of the curriculum. Chicago school became the mainstream macro. So Krugman writes that by the early 80s, the only way to get non-crazy macroeconomics published was to wrap sensible assumptions about output and employment in something else, something that involved rational expectations and inter intertemporal stuff and made the paper respectable. So basically, this is the way publishing works, that if something is fashionable and it became fashionable, then you couldn't get anything published unless you followed the mainstream ideology. This is very important. So if you write something, and if people think, people are told that we have freedom and intellectual freedom, and if you write something that is brilliant, even if it is uh, goes against dominant orthodoxy, people will be happy to listen to it. But this is not how it works. The game is rigged. Only the top 20 schools get uh, published in the top 20 journals. And uh, there are many strong biases in publication. As if you are within the mainstream, you can get any kind of junk published. And if you are outside and unorthodox, then you can't. So basically, people knew that in order to get published, you have to adopt the mainstream macro methodology, which necessarily involves rational expectations and intertemporal <coughs> maximization. <coughs> so, macroeconomic madness. Many people have said that these RBC models are completely mad, like uh, Solo says that, you know, Lucas and Prescott, their models are crazy. And this one is also, Meyer says about RBC models, that it's a caricature, cartoon, that's so silly 
that you wouldn't want to get close to it if you were a policy maker. <coughs> so these DSGE models, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium, they don't have money in them because money doesn't matter. So that's one, I mean, immediately you know that this model is wrong because money does matter. So now the way that they, I mean, after the global financial crisis, they have uh, started to, I and mean, everybody re realizes that money matters. So the way that they, they make them work is by putting in fixed prices. You see, basically in a general equilibrium model, money disappears because money and prices are perfectly correct. If you double the amount of money, you double the prices, everything remains exactly the same. Everything else. So money doesn't matter. But uh, if you fix the prices, then uh, you get start getting out because now you money is out of equilibrium. And so that's how they make, they put in money into GSD models. But this is a very fake and artificial way to handle the issue. Money matters in a much more deep and so anyway the article by Romer says that one major macroeconomist well known leading says in one of his articles that he is not sure whether money matters or not now this is flabbergasting and yani what he is saying is that can tight monetary policy cause a recession leading macroeconomists of the time who are trained and respected say that we, we, we don't know. So basically Romer wants to say that there is very strong empirical evidence that tight money causes recessions and uh, to say that we don't know is really uh, ridiculous. So he gives the evidence about the Wooker recession. Wooker was uh, one of the heads of the Federal Reserve in the USA. So this is the data that is shown. The blue line on top is the base money, which is basically continuously going up. The CPI is the uh, rate of inflation. So you can see that the CPI and the uh, base money diverge. This uh, shows that basically, and visually you can see that the quantity theory is wrong. The money... Um, supply is not proportional and divergence starts in 80s when basically financial market liberalization took place. So um, the rate of money increase has been faster than the rate of inflation. Now in the bottom graph basically that is the derivative of the CPI that is inflation. So the curve on top, the red dashed curve that is the level of prices. The rate of change of that curve is the inflation rate which is plotted in the graph below. And you can see visually from the top graph that the slope of the CPI is flatter which means that inflation is lower. And that is what you see in the derivative graph below that the uh, in the first part the rate of growth of CPI is high, inflation is going up from 1960 to about 1980 where it reaches a peak then it suddenly goes down from 1980 to 1983 and then it stays down. So what um, uh, this was the period in which Walker was in control of the money at the Federal Reserve and he announced that I am going to bring the inflation down and he did it. So the idea that uh, money does not play a role, money is, direct, is immediately rejected by this graph. So here is more, some more data on how he did it and basically what he did was he raised the real interest rate and so uh, the blue line is the real rate which is actually the real um, discount rate. Now as economists you should know what the discount rate is. Basically the um, banks lend money at commercial rates of interest 
and in fractional reserve banking system, the amount of money that they have is only a fraction of the amount that they lend. In Pakistan, the fraction is relatively high. That is, if the banks lend 100,000, they have about that, um, yani, they will have in their um, banks maybe 50 to 75,000 rupees. So, only a small amount of overhang. Uh, in the USA and um, UK, uh, they have only about 5%. So they can they lend $100,000 and they have only $5,000 of cash sitting in their bank. <coughs> so it often becomes necessary for them to, and if somebody, you have 5000 and somebody presents a check for $20,000, now where are you going to get the money because you don't have it? You have lent it to others, you have, and you have written assets of 100000 uh, but you can't call in your loans. So what you do is you do short time, which is called overnight borrowing. That's called the federal fund, overnight borrowing. That Okay, you borrow from the state bank and you will return it tomorrow. And you can keep doing this. And you can also buy on the interbank, the famous LIBOR, London interbank rate, is the interbank rate. So basically, the state bank is the lender of the last resort. If you can't, borrow from anybody else, then by law, the state bank is supposed to give you a loan so as to prevent the banks from going bankrupt. And just like that, the IMF is the lender of the la last resort in the um, international market. So if somebody runs out of dollars to pay, then they are supposed to, uh, any IMF is supposed to lend them money. So, um, that's the instrument that they use. Prior to that, uh, central banks used to use the money supply and control directly the rate of growth of money, but for various reasons that didn't work too well. And so, they shifted to using the interest rates as the instrument for monetary policy. So, if you raise the interest rate, what happens? Well, basically, the banks are creating money and they they assume that they will have to borrow because they have more they have lent more than they have so the it must be the case that the uh, rate at which you borrow from the central bank is less than the commercial rate so suppose you lend at 8% and you borrow from the state bank at 5% so even if you borrow the whole amount uh, you will make a 3% profit and since the money is created uh, from nothing, uh, it's pretty good. So, anyway, the point is that when the federal funds rate goes up, then all the banks have to increase their own commercial rate in order to make sure that when they are uh, need to go to the state bank, they, they don't make losses on their loans. So, basically, this is the anchor and every all other rates. For example, the banks uh, can lend it. I will lend you at uh, state bank discount rate plus three percent. So this rate can change as the LIBOR plus uh, a margin is a common uh, uh, rate at which banks lend. So now the the federal funds rate is uh, a number, but the real rate, which is the blue line, is the that number minus the inflation rate. That's the standard uh, Fisher decomposition. Uh, you take out the nominal rate of growth of prices to get the real rate of interest. So basically, Walker wanted to bring down inflation and apparently you know, the theory says that if you increase the real rate of interest, this will cause a fall in inflation. So... Uh, <coughs> And how does that work? Well, basically, the, there are several channels. But one of the channels is that when the interest rate goes up, the demand for investment goes down because people cannot borrow money. And so the aggregate demand goes down 
and that causes a recession in the economy and that brings down the prices. So, <coughs> Uh, this is what the Fed wanted to do. It wanted to bring down um, inflation. That's what they announced. And they increased the rate. And uh, the blue line shows the, that the rate increased. They, they wanted to increase it by about 5%. So the rates were pretty close to zero. Uh, the, the baseline here is zero is the when Walker was appointed. He announced at at the time he was an announced, at the time he was appointed, uh, the real rate of inflation, the real um, funds rate was zero. That is, it was equal to inflation. Ten percent. That's very high. So uh, Walker had announced that he would try to bring the rate up to five percent, in order to. Uh, eliminate the inflation and you can see that he was trying the first recession was the first blue uh, first shaded graph uh, you can see that it's a recession by looking at the unemployment which went up sharply so here what we see is that the fed is uh, increasing the rate except for a small dip in the beginning and increasing the rate led to a fairly sharp uh, rise in inflation <coughs> and did not actually <coughs> control the inflation at that time. So, Walker apparently responded to this sharp jump in, in, uh, in unemployment by uh, bringing down the rate again. So, it went, the real rate went to nearly minus 5%. But after that, he decided that among the inflation, among the two evils, he would prefer to get rid of the inflation. And the inflation also was coming down. You see, in, in the initial period, he was raising the rates and he was getting unemployment, but no impact on inflation. But uh, afterwards, uh, inflation did start coming down, so he was encouraged and he went on with his policies and increased the blue line by a lot, which uh, brought down the inflation by a lot, but also increased the unemployment by a lot causing a recession. So this is the standard pattern and theory that there is a trade-off between inflation and employment and if we try to bring inflation down then we will have to accept high unemployment and cause a recession and currently basically the point is that the aggregate demand is too high so uh, and that is causing inflation and so to prevent inflation, we should uh, reduce the, we should have a contractionary money policy, high interest rates, low amounts of money, that will bring down the inflation at the cost of crashing the economy. Now, what Keynes said and what is true is that this choice does not have to be made. There are ways of running the economy in which we can keep inflation low and also keep full employment. But currently the theories that we have do not allow us to see those possibilities. So the whole point of this graph uh, that Romer is trying to say here is that to say that monetary policy doesn't matter in a real business, uh, basically the Inflation and monetary policy are tied together according to conventional theory, but unemployment is a real phenomenon. It should not be affected by monetary policy according to the real business cycle models. So here we see unemployment is uh, massively increased during the recession due to a tight monetary policy. Right, so this is what Romer writes that there is a simple causal explanation that the Fed aimed for a, a Fed is Federal Reserve Bank a nominal rate that was roughly 500 points above any uh, five percent basically the inside terminology in central banks is that the 100 basis points is one percent of interest. So 500 basis points above the 
prevailing inflation rate so that your real rate is 5%. <clears throat> it departed from this goal during the first recession as we saw briefly. High real interest rates decreased output and increased unemployment. The rate of inflation fell either because uh, of the big output gap and the higher unemployment or because of the Fed's actions which changed the expectations of the public. Both of these are reasons why yani, uh, inflation can go down. So basically, Romer says it's, it's absurd to wonder if monetary policy. How can a leading monetary economist think that monetary policy might not make any difference? So <clears throat> I have added to this another uh, episode uh, which is the Roosevelt re recession. Okay, so here um, we have to look at the um, unemployment rate in 1929, that's the Great Depression. So that's the orange line. So you see that unemployment rate is very low, but in 1929 it shoots up. So that's when the uh, depression hit and it goes up to about 25 percent and then um, in 1932, uh, Roosevelt was elected and then he started these Keynesian policies. He actually, at the time he was elected, he was also a budget balancer and he believed that budget should be balanced. But Keynes came to meet him and convinced him that you should run a deficit in order to uh, control the uh, recession and in order to bring the country out of the depression. So he followed that advice and you can see the effects that in 1933 the orange line starts declining uh, up until 1937. Now at 1937 basically he, uh, Roosevelt was never fully convinced. He said okay short term measure uh, deficit is okay but basically government should balance budgets. So in 1937 he thought that now we have done enough. And he went back to uh, trying to balance the budget and that immediately led to a spike in the uh, unemployment. So from 1937 to 38 we see a jump and that is uh, called the Roosevelt re recession. Basically he caused it by tightening the money supply and uh, once he realized that this is happening then he went back to his um, high deficit and monetary expansion policy and that orange line then started to go down again. If you look at the blue line that is the real GDP and uh, as you can see it goes up till 29 and then in 29 it starts declining up until 1932 when Roosevelt gets elected and then it starts going up. Again you can see that in the 1937 there is a dip in the output because of the uh, Roosevelt recession <clears throat> and then again when he corrects the monetary policy the economy picks up again. So again this shows <clears throat> and the gray line is just the money supply. In the money supply you can also see that uh, from 1932 to up to 1937 money is increasing steadily then in from 1937 to 38 it's flat. So that's again a contractionary monetary policy and that created the Roosevelt recession. So again we are saying that the data clearly shows that the money supply has a very important and powerful impact on the economy. Direct empirical evidence doesn't require very deep theory, complicated formulas. Just look at the graphs. So there is strong data support for the idea that money matters and therefore the real business cycles and the DSGE models which say that money plays no role are wrong. <coughs> <coughs> now, one thing important to understand is that I have been saying all along that the data is just the surface appearance. 
So at, uh, what we have seen in the picture is just a correlation. It is still possible that money does not matter. Uh, but now the burden of proof is on the p other side. If money doesn't matter, they have to find something which matters. So there might be some hidden forces which cause <coughs> the money to go down and the economy to go down. So find me something like that and show. So now the data seems to indicate, we, we, we can never prove theories with data because data only show correlations. Causation is always underneath the surface. So it is not true that yani, we have proven the case that money matters. It's just that there is very strong empirical evidence in the favor of this hypothesis. So now if you want to go against, you have to come up with some convincing alternative hypothesis and show how that matches. You can't just say, I don't believe it. All right, <clears throat> so the section two of Romer uh, discusses what the RBC models are, the real business cycle models. These are models which are currently in use in our own state bank and uh, all over the world, despite the global financial crisis where they failed miserably. So, <coughs> basically, um, this is uh, the, um, this is called growth decomposition. So, we have output, uh, this is just some dummy data to illustrate how uh, the real business cycle models are constructed. So basically in period T, the value of output in dollars is 2921 and T plus 1, the value of output is 3150. <coughs> so what we have is growth and the growth is 1.078. This is just the ratio of 3150 to 2921. So what we have is 7.8% growth. Now, <coughs> uh, the capital stock in period T was 620 at an increase to 663 in T plus 1. So this uh, factor grew by 6.9%. Just uh, taking the ratio of 663 to 620. Then the labor stock was valued at 680 and it shrunk to 673. So the growth was 0 0.990 which means that there was 1% reduction in the labor stock. The energy input into production was 770 in period T and 885. So there was a, this ratio is 1.149. So there is a 14.9% growth in the energy input. <clears throat> so basically the growth decomposition says that the growth in the output is due to the growth in the inputs. So basically what you, the, you try to decompose how much of the growth comes from capital, how much goes from labor and how much comes from energy. Oh, there's also materials. Oh, there's a missing blank line in there. Materials is raw materials, resources which are used in the process of production like cotton is used to make textiles and so on. So the materials were used in production were 624 and they became 643. That's a 3% growth rate. This is actually called the CLEM production function, capital, labor, energy and materials. <coughs> this is more uh, suitable for real world than the Cobb Douglas, which only has capital and labor. So the total input in period T was 2694, that's just adding up all the CLEM inputs. Then you'll calculate the share. <coughs> so the share is 0 0.230 of capital, which is basically 620 divided by 2694. The total input and the share of capital in the total input. Similarly, uh, labor has a 25% share, energy has a 28% share and materials have a 23% share. So, 
then you just say you multiply this share by the growth rate so 0 0.230 times 1.069 comes to 0 0.246 so basically you say that 24.6 percent of the total growth was due to capital and then 25 percent was due to labor and then 32.9 percent was due to energy <coughs> and 23.9% was due to materials. Now, if you add up all of these growths, you get 1.063. So, you have a total growth of 6.3% in the inputs. But the total growth of output was 7.8%. So, there is what is known as the residual. <coughs> this is called the solar residual because Solo was the first to do these things. Actually, I think some other people also did that. So, they were trying to find out that, okay, growth is occurring. What is it due to? Is it due to capital growth? Is it due to labor? Those were the two things that they considered, but since then we look at. So, how much of growth is coming from capital? How much <coughs> growth is coming from labor? They expected on the basis of theory that these things would add up, but actually there was a substantial residual. Here 1.8 percent, 1.5 percent is a residual. <coughs> So, this is called 15% uh, No, I think it's 1.5, but anyway, it's, it's 1.5. <coughs> so, the difference, so what, where is this additional 1.5% coming from? Uh, somebody has said this is a measure of our, our ignorance, we don't know. When the solo actually did it, he conjectured that this was due to technological change. This number is also called the total factor productivity. It means that individually in isolation the factors uh, produce this much growth, but taken together they, uh, they have some harmony and they create this additional growth. So, um, what um, uh, Romer says that this is phlogiston, basically what he says, phlogiston is a mythical substance. Pre previously, physicists believed that this uh, is the, uh, this exists, uh, I think it's the stuff that makes the fire burn, but uh, it was found that it was, this, there is no such thing and the explanation for fire was, and another explanation was discovered for fire, why fire burns. So, uh, we will see why, um, basically you have, uh, if, you, if you do the uh, standard production function decomposition, you find that the change in output is uh, alpha, any yani the capital share times the change in capital plus beta labor share times the change in labor. So, there should be, uh, then you can say that there is a residual which is additional, the, the, the shock or just like in your regression equations, you add an error term. So, you add an error term to that equation and you get your shock. So, that is the phlogiston. Now, one more thing in the, we might mention in the passing is that here the capital output ratio is um, 2921 the output divided by capital 620 this is often used to understand the how much capital we need but actually cap capital output ratio is not very useful what people use is called the incremental capital output ratio this is a very important concept currently still being used uh, so basically, suppose we want to get a certain amount of growth. How much uh, investment should we make in Pakistan in order to achieve 6% growth, for example? So you look at these two figures. Suppose these are the figures for Pakistan and you see that uh, we increased the capital by 43 units and we got an increase in output by 229 units. So the additional capital we needed was 43 units of capital and that led to 
229 units of growth. So the incremental capital output ratio is 229 to 43. So on this basis, we can say that you can buy, I, I, don't, I didn't do the calculations, 40 times 5 is 200, so about 5 to 1 is the ratio. So if you have a particular target that I want to get, take this uh, 3150 to 3500, so that's about 350 units of additional output that I want, then I will need about one-fifth of that, maybe uh, 80 or 100 units of capital investment in order to achieve that growth. So that's how the ICOR is used to t get a target level for how much investment we need to make in order to get a certain amount of growth. So the key question we are asking is why do business cycles happen? In uh, the Great Depression is just one big cycle in the big business cycle and there are smaller cycles. So basically if we say that the change in growth is equal to the change in uh, labor plus the change in capital, uh, that's the real business cycle model. The business cycle model says that change in output occurs due to changes in inputs. Money does not matter. This is very important to understand that. Why do, why do business cycles happen? Well, they happen because of the error term. So if the error term goes up, then the growth goes up. If the error term goes down, then... So what is this error term? Nobody knows. That's why it's calling phlogiston. So we basically we are saying that um, the business cycle, the real business cycle model says that the business is driven by the real factors, but business cycle ha happens because of unknown reasons. This is the fundamental, these, these errors. So... <clears throat> Eugene Fama was the inventor of the efficient markets hypothesis and what he says is that the stock prices reflect information about the real world. So basically um, uh, uh, a stock is a share in a company. The company has some real rate of return that is going to be uh, the worth of the stock depends on its real activities and basically the value of the stock is the present discounted value of the returns that the uh, company will earn. So uh, of course nobody knows the returns but people have unbiased estimates of these returns so you can take expectation and calculate the average value of the present discounted returns. <coughs> now <coughs> the standard story about the GFC is that it happened due to the stock market crash. But the uh, real business cycle school says that no, it happened due to the negative um, shocks in the um, technology. This one of the things that this can be is a technology shock there. Okay, so <clears throat> Eugene Farmer was asked after the crash that, well, do you think that the efficient markets, what do you think of the efficient market hypothesis now? So he says that yeah, it, it worked very well. Uh, everybody else is saying that efficient markets was actually the cause of the collapse because with the efficient market hypothesis, if the market is going up, that means that the value of the stocks is going up, the economy is doing well. <clears throat> so, there is no reason to worry because if there was some discrepancy, then the market would correct. So, the fact, so there, when Ben Bernanke, if some time before the crash, he was asked, look, there are bubbles and the housing prices are going up and stocks are going up. So, he said, no, bubbles cannot happen. This is fine. There is nothing wrong. Uh, similarly, Larry Summers was also in a, actually, I think it was Ravi Batra, Ravi Batra, I think. Uh, there was a big uh, meeting in international finance just one year before of, of uh, many leading economists before the crash and Ravi Batra said that, you know, there's uh, markets are overheating and we should take some action. 
So somebody said, nonsense, there is nothing wrong, everything is fine. And basically, this cannot happen. I mean, markets cannot overheat because markets are rational. <coughs> so, so the usual, uh, so what Pharma says is that, why did the stock market crash if the markets are rational? He said that, well, people knew that the recession was going to happen and so uh, the efficient market uh, price came down because the economy was going down so they foresaw that the recession was coming. So basically it was then the recession which was in the future which caused the stock market price to collapse. Now the point that I have been making from the beginning is that the observations can never tell you the true story so it's always possible to invent a story about what happened in the background. and. That's all we can do, Yanni. There is no, we, we cannot say that I have the facts and they have the theories and my facts are ro right and their theory. Ours is also a theory. We also have a theory about the background. The only thing we can say is that this theory is more plausible than the other theory. Uh, we cannot say that, mm, we cannot guarantee that our theory is right because all theories are about the hidden background. So, uh, you can you, you cannot directly compare the theory with the reality because the reality is hidden. But you can look at implications of that theory. So, you can indirectly test theories and that is how it is done. We can say, okay, suppose this theory is true, then it has such and such implication. Can we see this in the data? So, that is how you you test theories indirectly. So, Pharma says that he doesn't know what credit bubble means. This is after the global financial crisis. So, here is Pharma's explanation of the global financial crisis. There was an economic slowdown in 2005, <coughs> which is <coughs> two years before the crisis. So, a recession started, small recession in 2005. Uh, because of this recession, job growth slowed down and income growth slowed down and some homeowners could not make their monthly payments because especially because of the subprime borrowers who had taken out the risky mortgages. And so when um, delinquencies started happening and foreclosures started occurring, the house mortgage market started collapsing, then there was uh, heavy losses that the bank started suffering. And these losses caused them to cut back on lending. And when they cut back on lending, then uh, the money became tight. And when the money became tight, then the recession happened. So he said, basically, he said that Pharma says that it wasn't a credit crisis. People are saying that this is a monetary thing, but this is not a monetary. This is a real phenomenon. The money uh, market responded to events in the real world. So this is the real business cycle view of the world. <coughs> So there is one problem that, okay, suppose we accept all of this story, why did the slowdown occur in 2005? There is no explanation. If the it was not the mortgage blow up, then what did cause? So Pharma just laughs and he says that nobody knows what causes recessions. I am not a macroeconomist, so I do not feel badly, I mean I do not, I do not, I am not responsible to answer this question. We have never known how recessions are caused. So today, there is a debate about what caused the Great Depression. So basically, if you take the real business cycle view, then there was this random shock uh, that occurred to the phlogiston, the error term, which uh, makes the difference between the. So what is the story? The real business cycle story is that all factors grow at certain rates and the real output grows by the sum of these plus some random shock. And that random shock has been labeled by Romer as phlogiston. So there is a crucial missing step in this uh, explanation given by Pharma that what was this random shock? Oops. So uh, when he asked, uh, when asked it what caused this deep depression, so he blamed the. There are two government organizations. One of them was created in 1938 after the Great Depression 
to help people buy houses. He doesn't actually buy houses. What it's, it's, uh, their real name is Federal National Mortgage Association, but it is called uh, FNMA is the initials. It's called Fannie Mae, just uh, as an abbreviation. So this was created. What the job was, it, it doesn't deal directly with the public. It deals with banks. Banks issue mortgages. Now when you issue a mortgage, you give $100,000 as a loan and you are going to get $1,000 a month for the next 30 years. This is the standard 30 years mortgage. So <coughs> banks uh, don't have any, can quickly run out of money in these situations. So what the Fannie Mae was supposed to do is it looked at the mortgage and it said that if this is a sound mortgage according to certain rules which they had, then uh, it's a, that, that's a qualifying mortgage, then they would buy the mortgage from the bank. So then they would give the bank the $100,000 that it has lent and take the mortgage away. And so the bank would have more liquidity, it could lend to more people. So that was the goal. Uh, Freddie Mac, FHMLC, Federal Home Loan Mortgage Corporation, was in, created in 1970 as part of financial liberalization measures to create competition in this mar market for buying loans and also to do certain other things. So basically Pharma said that it was these people, the government, buying uh, useless mortgages which uh, led to the financial crisis. So that's the, the government is to blame. So uh, actually I've put down a lot of articles on the web page. Some of them show that the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are to blame and others argue not. So this is an ongoing debate. But basically this debate is not so much about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, it is about free markets versus government. So there is a group that says that free markets are always good. And the standard view of the global financial crisis is that the free markets failed and uh, the crisis was called by the, uh, caused by f uh, f too much by unregulated finance. But the alternative view, what the free marketeers say is that no, it was caused by government interference with free markets. And <clears throat> as Polanyi has said, there is a debate which can never be resolved because always we are talking about hidden mechanisms and there is no situation in which there is uh, no control. The government is always has some regulations and it's necessary. So the free market is always get to say that it is because of these regulations that the collapse occurred while the uh, other side says that no, it was because of the... So glass is half empty and half full and you can blame either side party for the... So when, you, when it comes to the mechanism, the real mechanism is hidden because reality is always hidden. So it is always possible to make a case for free markets even though there is never, there is never going to be uh, There is never going to be, you know, factual evidence because reality is hidden. <coughs> so going back to um, Great Depression, similar argument was made by Friedman and Schwartz. In their book called A Monetary History of the USA, 1870, uh, this is a very famous book. So what they argue is, again, that the Great Depression was caused by the government actions and not by uh, free markets, although everybody else believes otherwise. So their explanation in, given in this book is that in the spring of 1928, the Federal Reserve began to tighten its monetary policy. This resulted in rising interest rates and continued that policy until the stock market crashed. So again, more or less the same mechanism, but here they have a culprit, the, the Federal Reserve. Uh, made a blunder, used a tight monetary policy. <coughs> uh, this monetary policy caused the economy to enter a recession in mid-29 before the stock market crash and this caused the stock market crash a few months later. And then in 1931, it raised interest rates to defend the dollar in response to speculative attacks against the dollar by foreign markets which were also suffering from the Great Depression. 
And this raising of interest rates uh, again uh, strengthened and lengthened the depression and it also caused difficulties to commercial banks. <coughs> uh, also, when another mistake that the Federal Reserve made was that it allowed banks to collapse if they didn't have enough capital and that led to a very substantial decline in the money supply and that was responsible for the Great Depression. So again, now we have a, the monetarist or the um, uh, free market explanation of the Great Depression. It was not due to capitalism, it was due to government interference and government wrong policies. So basically the <coughs> <coughs> the complaint against Keynesian models that was made was that these are not micro founded. We are just talking about the aggregates, but there is no micro level basis for this. The RBC models are supposed to be micro founded. They are supposed to be based on the behavior of the consumers and the behavior of the firms. So when you look at a real RBC model, it starts by saying that there is a consumer he has a utility function, he is trying to maximize consumption over lifetime according to this sum of discounted utilities and now <coughs> the other mo rest of the model is set up, so you have some production function, of that production he can consume some part and save other part and now you do the maximization. <coughs> this requires techniques in dynamic programming, so <coughs> when you are studying advanced my macro, you will be studying dynamic programming. This involves doing Pontryagin's equation, also Bellman's equations. <coughs> you set up these equations which show you how to do this infinite horizon maximization problem. Now, and, and you are taught all of these techniques. Now, what I want to say is that you should understand what these techniques are, but you don't need to learn what they are in terms of how to do them because uh, today you have symbolic mathematical packages that will do the job for you. So you give them the maximization problem and you say, okay, solve it and it will give you the solution <coughs> even in algebraic terms or you can follow along. You don't need to understand what is in the backbone. Just like today you don't need to learn the long division by hand if you want to divide two numbers. I don't know how many of you learned it. Of course, we had we were taught it but you put one number on one side, the other number on the other side, you draw a little bar and then you do this very complicated maneuvers and often you make a mistake because this is long and complicated and then you say oh, this answer didn't come out right, <coughs> now I have to check it again. <coughs> so, but you don't need to do that, you just put it on your calculator or put it in Excel and you get the answer. You don't need to know how it is done, <coughs> as long as you know what is going on. You multiply the two numbers, you should get the answer. Just like that, the maximization, which is taught, and there are now, if you see, your first course in mathematical economics is based on Alpha Chiang, and the second course in mathematical economics goes through <coughs> dynamic programming and solving any calculus of variations and solving these kind of optimal problems. But the number of problems that you can actually solve by hand is few, is four or five good, nice, smooth, regular problems. Real world problems are so messy you can't solve them by hand. So the only way to solve them is to feed them to the computer. So you should learn how to uh, understand what the optimization problem because that's how macro is done. Now, the reality is that this has nothing to do with real world in the sense that nobody sets up when we are trying to maximize something, yani nobody sets up an infinite horizon maximization problem to solve because we don't know what will happen next year. So this is the one of the things that Keynes said that there is radical uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen next year. So we can't do this maximization that you're supposed to be doing because to do the maximization you have to have some idea about what is going to be happening and also that idea has to be unbiased, it has to be right. Now there are many, many ways to show that future is fundamentally unpredictable because, well, many ways. So, <coughs> once you 
have all information about all the real quantities, then it turns out, which, which is assumed in Darwin, then it turns out that money will not play a big role. So Prescott was teaching graduate students at the University of Minnesota that postal economics, how you know the mail goes, is more important than monetary economics <coughs> because mon money doesn't matter. <coughs> Now, the problem is this the second sentence is from, uh, both sentences are actually from Romer. Romer says that what does this negative phlogiston shock mean? And we can understand that, okay, the factor growth was 23% and the other one was 24%, so the total growth should be the sum of those and maybe a little bit more. But labor grew by. <coughs> so much and <coughs> capital grew by so much but the total growth did not grow. <coughs> now this is baffling and he, all the inputs are going up but the output is coming down. How can that happen? So what is a negative technology shock? Suddenly the technology became worse and that's uh, how one would understand it. Or you see after the technology people said that no technology cannot explain the residual, it's human capital. So now the human capital went down, people suddenly became more ignorant, uh, more unable to do their jobs. <clears throat> it doesn't seem to make sense. So uh, he mentions an incident where Prescott was holding a oral defense of one of his students. So the student took an RBC model and calibrated it. This is one of the two problems that we want to mention um, with RBC. Calibration is just, you see, basically there is estimation. You take the model and you try to estimate the model. So estimation of the model does not work because the data does not match the models well enough to allow for estimation. It Often the data contradicts what the model is saying. <coughs> so what you do is you take some key parameters and you say, okay, so what is the labor capital share? Uh, that is uh, labor, we have 75 percent and 25 percent. So one of the parameters that you need in your RBC model is the alpha. So you say, okay, so we see that there is labor is 75 percent. So we set alpha equals 75 percent. So basically you try for a rough match on those quantities which can be matched without worrying about the quantities which do not match, which is what you would need to do if you were doing an estimation you're doing an estimation, then you would try to match everything. But that doesn't work, so they just try to match a few things which you need to get the numbers that you want to feed into your model without worrying about the mismatches. <coughs> so this person who was an outsider uh, observer, he said uh, he, he was quite surprised by this calibration because it didn't seem to have any scientific value that you're doing something which basically you're assuming that the model is true and the data is false, except when it is useful. If it contradicts you, you ignore it. If it is helpful to you, you use it. So this is self-contradictory. That's why he said that this seems like a useless exercise. But anyway, he said that without uh, uh, thinking about it, that what are these technology shocks? So just uh, to ask for an explanation because he couldn't understand them. So. This was the weak point he had by accident hit the Achilles heel of the whole program. So Ed Prescott tensed up physically like he had taken a bullet. <laughs> After awkward four or five seconds he said that just, just that traffic, anything. Yani, there is no explanation, it's just, it is just random noise. Traffic is making random noise. <laughs> so. Um, Romer goes to say that uh, because of the complete disregard for any facts, uh, if data contradicts it, no problem. So he says that this is uh, post-real. Uh, there's reality and then there's beyond reality. So these people live in the post-real world. So instead of real business cycles, we should call them PRBC, post-real business cycle models. 
so when people uh, argue that these shocks are imaginary they come they don't exist in the real world you have no counterpart show me the shock so he says look at the traffic so what is uh, yani everything that happens in the real world should have some something that is there that that is so in response to this the standard defense uh, comes from milton friedman's that the more significant the theory the more more and realistic the assumptions and there is also the idea that has been floated that all models are false uh, basically this says that you know models must simplify reality and because they simplify so automatically they are false so basically what he says is that these uh, the approach the methodology is completely non scientific in the sense that you make your theory and you have no concern about whether this theory matches facts or not so after uh, the uh, real business cycle people got comfortable with the idea of imaginary shocks then they introduced a lot more of them so he says that uh, uh, in order to basically uh, we will see how it works but basically the goal of your model is to produce a match to the observed curve now you can put in anything you like into the model that's what friedman says so he says okay we can start putting it random shocks to anything there's this technology shock there's this phlogiston which uh, increases the quantity of consumption goods produced by inputs so you have a uh, consumption goods are produced and there is a technology which produces them so you look at the inputs which go and then you have a little shock so, there, so if there is a deviation between these two now you have an explanation it was due to this phlogiston which increased so that caused an increase so you have the real factor and then you have an imaginary factor so all so the real business cycle models could also be called imaginary business cycle models because the part of the explanation is being done by the real input and part is being done by this imaginary error <coughs> then there is this investment specific shock which <coughs> works on the uh, on the capital goods so previously we had just one phlogiston you take all the inputs and you add one error and you get the output <coughs> they say no every every input has its own error because you want to get a closer match to the data this was the basic basic problem with the rbcs that yes they match some of the things but they are very different on other things we saw that uh, graph last time that the rbc models produced a very good match to the uh, <coughs> great depression or was it the business cycle for a part of the period and then there was a huge deviation so how do you fix that huge deviation you put in more random shocks and you are free to introduce as many shocks as you like so this differentiates the two shocks that okay there are two types of output shocks one is for consumption goods one is for producer goods and then there is random shocks to wages uh so uh then there is random shocks to the price of output and then there are random shocks to the risk preferences of the investors and then there can be random shocks to people who want to work or who uh, don't want to work this can also change at random so now you have a lot of little places where you can put in changes in order to match the observed data <coughs> so just as a little bit of background i want to talk about war models vector autoregressive models because this is used in the paper and next time i will give a more serious discussion of the standard macro stuff so take any collection of variables it can be any collection uh, but let's say it's consumption gnp and money so our vector of three variables is x which is c y and m transpose it's a upright vector but i have written it as a row vector <coughs> so the vector autoregressive model in very simple terms is written as x equals a x t minus 1 plus r because x is a vector a is a 3 by 3 matrix and then x is a t minus 1 is a 3 by 1 vector and then the error is 3 by 1 error 
or you can have this is a first order one you can have second order vars which you go to t minus 2 t minus 3 and you can also uh, introduce lags on the errors so you have error at time t error t minus 1 these are arma type models uh, to make it more clear I have the uh, written out component by component that the consumption, the income and the money is uh, equal to a matrix which is multiplying one period lags on these things plus the errors. <coughs> now there is a 3 by 3 matrix of parameters that we need to estimate uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, these parameters are not identified. Uh, we will discuss this identification issue more precisely later. Here I just want to put, uh, just give a rough idea. So, there is something called the curse of dimensionality. As you increase the size of the vector, if you have m variables, you get m squared parameters to estimate. So. Uh, the higher the dimension of your vector, the more parameters you have to estimate. Now, uh, in addition to having too many parameters, uh, there is a second problem which comes from the identification issue. All right, so I guess I'm. So, on the one hand, you get very imprecise estimates. <coughs> Basically, is a rule of thumb that if you have t parameters to estimate, you need about t squared uh, observations to estimate it uh, precisely. So, if you have a nine parameters, about 81, a series of length 81. This is just a rule of thumb, 100 if you have 100 observations, but as you start increasing the dimensionality, the numbers go up very quickly and you do not have that much data. <coughs> so, a solution to this problem is to put down the priors on these parameters. This is the Bayesian solution, but basically this means that the data does not have any information about the parameters. So, I am just going to add my own prior beliefs, prior beliefs just and so, then what you are getting is what you have put in. So, basically you are hiding a lot of yani, uh, uh, to the world, you are showing that this is what my model says, but actually this is what I say. <coughs> a prior is just something that I know is true in advance. <coughs> now, one very important thing to understand, <coughs> you can <coughs> build a war. You can feed it to the computer, you will get your estimates. Um, so that is all, I mean once you know what a war is and uh, you do not need to know how it is estimated, you just feed it to the computer, it will produce estimates. Uh, they will have all of these problems. But now the, uh, the main uh, issue with the war is that uh, in your normal regression model, <coughs> you ask the question, what will happen? if C t minus 1 changes by 1 percent and A 1 1 will tell you that okay, the effect of the of a of a 10 percent change in C t minus 1 will be A 1 1 times 10 percent. But this question is not legitimate in a VAR model. Why is it not legitimate? Because? No, not because of the error term because c t minus 1 is an endogenous variable. It, you cannot control it, you cannot change it. c t minus 1 was determined by previous period. So, the only exogenous variables are here are the error. So, what we talk about is what happens if there is a shock to the consumption equation. So, if epsilon 1 t changes, that is something that we can analyze. We cannot analyze what happens if c t minus 1 changes because that makes the model inconsistent. C t minus 1 is being given by an equation uh, which was the last period and now you say C t minus how did it change? If it C t minus 1 can change then your equation is not, not correct. So, uh, you cannot do the standard interpretation that you do in your regression models <coughs> and so 
what you do is you do what is called impulse response functions. So you say that okay epsilon 1, so you say uh, there is the normal function, suppose all the epsilons are zeros, then the uh, uh, the path of the consumptions will be the normal path which the equation dictates. Now what happens if you make epsilon 1 t equal to 1 unit? then you trace the effects of this change on all of the variables through time and that is called the impulse response. Uh, there is also a pulse response which is uh, there's another name step or threshold response. So you say okay epsilon 1 goes up by one unit and stays at that level for a long time. It turns out that under uh, reasonable conditions you can break down a complicated, uh, uh, complicated interventions into steps into small pieces and put them all together <coughs> in linear models. So basically just to show you this is a real war model and in, in this real model this is the impulse response this is a complicated picture uh, because the blue line is the impulse response it is the impulse response of output I think this is the smetz wouter model which we will discuss soon. So there was a monetary shock that was given to the model at period 0. Uh, so the monetary shock, we don't know actually, uh, I guess it was, it may be, it's a positive shock usually, one, one additional unit of money was added. <coughs> it immediately caused a decline in output. Why? Because in uh, RBC models, everything is efficient. So now everything is working at best possible results. Now if you put in, um, if you have flexible prices then money was, will just not matter at all. It's even uh, less important to the postal service. But so, so the way they get results in for money to matter in uh, RBC models is that they say that okay let the prices be fixed. If the price is fixed then the money of the, then when the money shock occurs then the quantity of money increases beyond its equilibrium level and this is going to cause damage. It's not unlike the um, Keynesian model where increased quantity of money can reduce the output gap and therefore Im increase the output. Uh, in RBC models everything is functioning well without interference. So whenever you give it a shock it will cause a damage. But it causes very little damage. It causes a minus zero zero 2% damage. So money doesn't really matter very much even, even that shock and then it jumps smoothly back to zero. Now the other uh, squares are just uh, transmission channels. There are many other variables in the model and so the effect on the output goes through all of these. So there is a lot of positive shocks and a lot of negative shocks and they all cancel out so that ultimately the effect on output is zero. So these are channels of transmission for monetary shocks and you can trace them in your DSGE models. So uh, because of this very serious problem that all DSGE models, RBC models have is that they have too many parameters. It's not possible to estimate them. Also the Bayesian methodology which was developed by Smets and Wouter was um, uh, invented and has become very popular. So now you hide your uh, identify. Basically you feed in the prior which tells the model what to do and the model behaves as you teach it to. But uh, when you talk to the lay audience, they say here is the printout of the model. It, uh, I didn't do anything. This is the model saying that this is what will happen. So now he says, they, uh, he, he, um, um, Romer says, they, okay, what do we do? What do we get out of the smetz wouter model? Uh, so the results. So they say that basically demand shocks like risk premium, exogenous spending and technology shock explain a significant fraction of the short term forecast variance in output. So you see basically you have these impulse responses, you have all of these errors in your model and now you are tracing these impulse responses. So you look at uh, output is fluctuating. So you 
trace it back to which factor causes how much fluctuation. Just as in the previous picture, we have the overall shock and then it's decomposed into shocks due to one part, other part, second part. So basically it says that the demand shocks uh, matter uh, and technology shocks also ma matter. So basically he says a very sensible uh, conclusion of the model is that inflation comes out mostly from the price shocks and the wage shocks. Okay, that makes sense that um, in a model the inflation is due to prices and wages so if there are shocks in the price and wage equation they will automatically get built into the in inflation. So basically what Romer is trying to say here, he is trying to mock the RBC model by saying that they have no explanation of anything and they are making these imaginary forces do all the job and then they are saying, okay, uh, why, why did it uh, fluctuate? Well, it was because the troll changed the wage and the gremlin changed the prices and the caloric changed the labor supply and so now we have, uh, that's how they so that's yani, because of these, these are random errors which have no explanation and all of the job of explaining why output, why the business cycle is happening is being, all of the responsibilities are being placed on these things which nobody knows what they are, nobody knows what they correspond to in the real world, nobody knows what they mean. Uh, just, yani, you see, what is a wage shock? Uh, you observe last year's wages average was 1000, today the wages uh, are uh, 1100, so you have a 10% increase in the wage. That's the factor which is the regressor. Now you say that this regressor plus some random shock is what we are going to take as the wage change and feed into the model. So now this random shock, it allows you to adjust the wage to whatever is needed to explain what you saw. You have just sort of infinite number of fudge factors which you can adjust in order to get then the explanation is, comes out like this that what explains what is happening are things that no one knows. So now what happens this is the calibration business that We are very flexible. You see, uh, when they originally published that paper, uh, Smets Wouter, somebody criticized them that the uh, you are saying that, for example, that the price and wage shock was the main cause for explanation, uh, explaining, the, these had very large uh, proportions of the explanation for explaining inflation and real wages. Uh, intuitively, we have some understanding of how much which factor matters. So if you have model is saying that these factors matter a lot when we think that in reality uh, some other factors were very important. So. Um, he says, okay, that's not a problem. What we do is if we, if we introduce a shock in some other place, uh, that will make these shocks go down. So you can adjust the model to any, any pattern that you like by introducing uh, suitable shocks. And so basically what Romer is saying at a deeper level is that this idea that we are explaining things is wrong. This is not how scientific explanation works. Uh, scientific explanation requires real causes. Here, because of this Friedman methodology which says that you can have imaginary models with imaginary concepts, as long as they match, they are fine, then we can introduce anything we like and we can, uh, the only thing that matters is that we have a match on the observations and in the model we can put in uh, gremlins and trolls and 
calorics, whatever we want. And that's what they are doing. So now as I said the identification problem we will um, discuss in greater detail later. But uh, basically he generated a set of uh, artificial data on labor and wages uh, for labor supply and labor demand functions. And as you know the supply and demand function are not identified because if you have both of them you have two equations in two variables and uh, it's not possible to disentangle them. So he says that if I try to estimate labor supply and demand both from this pattern of data which would be generated by a real world uh, labor supply demand equilibrium then uh, the computer will produce no output because it will lead uh, to an error because the matrix that you are trying to invert will not be invertible. So then you have to make some assumption and that is the identification assumption. So he shows two assumptions. The blue line is called a vertical supply of labor. So he says that okay the supply of labor is fixed at this blue line and now you can estimate the demand function and the demand function is the dotted blue line. Or you can say that the supply function is a line which passes through the origin and so uh, if a line passes through the origin, that's the, that's the solid red line. Once you impose that restriction that the intercept of the labor supply function is zero, then um, that identifies the labor supply function and then that also identifies the labor demand function. So you get those estimates. So you have to make some assumption to uh, get identification. So basically the rule of thumb is, and this is again something we are going to discuss later, that in a simultaneous equation model you have some exogenous variables and some endogenous variables. Uh, and so endogenous variables are those which occur on the left hand side which you are explaining, but you can use those endogenous variables as regressors and that is called a structural equation model. But the basic rule of thumb for identification is that for each exogenous variable you can estimate one parameter. So if you put, if you have an endogenous variable and it is explained by uh, more variables than you have exogenous variables in the system, then the equation is not identified. So now this particular VAR equation, you have uh, m equations, you have m variables which are explaining but you have no exogenous variables. So you are faced with a very serious uh, identification problem. You can put in a constant term that gives you one exogenous variable and it allows you to estimate one parameter. But so, so you get you get to estimate one parameter per equation but you have the, and that gives you m parameters you can estimate but you have m squared parameters to uh, estimate. Uh, the lagged variables are actually in a confusing situation. As I said, they are endogenous, but they are also predetermined at the time when the, you come into period T, then they are known. And these variables have a sort of a uh, technically difficult status. In some situations, they can help you in identification, in some situations, they cannot. Uh, the standard VAR assumptions, they cannot help you in identification, but you can make some additional assumptions to make them uh, work for you. But in any case, in order to make your uh, RB estimate your model correctly, you have to make a lot of assumptions. Uh, so he says that identification takes place by obfuscation, which is basically hiding things, uh, not by identity. He, he gives an example of how you can use a lot of technical detail and hide the identification assumption somewhere or you can use a Bayesian prior to create identification. And the interesting thing is that you can make assumptions in one part of the system and it can cause identification in other parts of the system. As we saw in the labor uh, uh, supply and demand example, you make a assumption about the supply, it identifies the demand. A calibration is also a way of identification by assumption. You um, and this is how DSG models achieve identification. So in the Bayesian terminology you have a prior and then you have a posterior and um, 
learning take place if the prior is the same as the posterior then the information that you have fed in is what you are getting out so there is not so the data is not informative if the posterior changes then technically it suggests that the data is informative but uh, this can be used to mislead so basically what Romer's main goal in this paper is to show how deceptive and misleading uh, RBC models are so what he is saying is that you can use this Bayesian terminology to deceive people. You feed in a sharp prior curve for the supply curve in the, the blue line. Uh, this blue line is not identified. So you will have to say that the data, you, you will say when you are writing it up that the data is not very inter informative about the value of the intercept of the supply parameters. So I pinned it down by my prior and the prior was the same as the posterior. Data didn't tell me much about that. But the demand curve is sharply estimated. The prior that we put in is very different from the posterior. And so uh, the implication is that the data is giving me information about the demand curve. But this is not true. Uh, so all of the information that we are getting about the demand curve is really coming from the prior information on the supply curve intercept. So this is just deception. So this is an irony because the program, the whole program of DSG was launched because uh, the, the up till until 1970s when I was studying, there were no DSG models. Uh, we were uh, studying, uh, the, the standard methodology was called simultaneous equation models and these were uh, structural models. In structural models you have uh, dependent variables being the endogenous variables and independent variables reflecting the structure of the economy. So if you have money supply, it should take those variables which, uh, which affect the money supply and it should exclude those variables which don't have the money supply. So basically the way you get identification is by making sure that you only have, if you have uh, n in the exogenous variables, you can only put in n variables into that system, although you will have more variables available. So as long as you exclude a lot of variables which you are, and, and you do that on the basis of theoretical grounds, you say that in my consumption function, interest rate doesn't belong, technology doesn't belong and so on because I know that consumption is not affected by these factors. So this is again a priori but at least what you assume is out there for everyone to see. So now when in 1970s there was widespread failure of these uh, econometric models. So people said there were two sets of critiques that were made. One was the Sims critique and the Sims critique said that uh, the identification assumptions that we make are not good. Uh, we are just assuming that this variable doesn't belong and um, we don't know. So what you should do is use these VAR models, the vector autoregressor. Just put everything in and then see what you can do. Of course, what Sims didn't realize is that even more serious identification problems arise. Uh, there was an alternative, the other critique. So the same says that theory is causing us damage. We are using theory to exclude variables and the theory is not reliable. The Lucas made the opposite critique. He said that our models are ad hoc. We are just putting, taking some variables here and putting some variables there. Very, our model should be micro-founded. We should start by utility functions of the consumers, production functions of the firms, and then uh, work with what are called deep parameters, what, the tastes of the consumers and the technology of the firms, these are what will determine the economy and derive the models out of these micro foundations. So this was done and ultimately uh, after three decades of effort on this, we are back at square one. All the models that we are using are unidentified just like the uh, previous models identification is being achieved by ad hoc assumptions, by prior distributions and by tricks and gimmicks. Uh, whereas, uh, uh, so it's not, the, the guess, you see when Lucas came up with his critique, at that time these models were not in existence. So, but on the basis of his ideas, the models were developed, but they did not solve the problem in the way that he had hoped. He had thought that these um, deep parameters would lead to identification, but they did not. So then he goes into, Romer goes into why this is happening, why the economists are acting as a clique. They act to protect reputations, not to, they are not concerned so much with uh, the correspondence with facts as with 
pleasing the leading individuals. So once I wrote an econometrics paper in which I had criticized Zellner, so they made me take that out and then it was published. So uh, this is certainly true, there is no doubt about that. So loyalty overrides science. People are, and he gives examples of how people in uh, Lucas uh, uh, has supported his friend, even though his own research was against it. In his public address, he said that monetary economics is not important, even though his own research shows a lot of role for money. And similarly, uh, when uh, a paper is criticized that this paper has unplausible assumptions, so the authors write that we are uh, doing things uh, as intended by Lucas. So again, this is not a proper response to a referee. I mean, you are supposed to do things if they are right, and not if they are wrong, not, not according to the authorities in the field. So uh, he says that Lucas started the launch the revolution in economics by saying that Keynesian models achieve identification by making assumptions which are not credible. That was widely known and accepted. But the situation is now worse. DSG made, models make hidden identification assumptions and these are far more incredible. The Keynesian models uh, assumption make honest assumptions and they are plausible. These make assumptions which are like the expected value of the log of this error term is zero uh, of some obscure equation and that creates identification. Nobody knows what this is, what it means and even that identification has been done by this method. People don't even mention this word. So they have hidden all of this. Uh, so Lucas also said that Keynesian models failed because they uh, made a very bad prediction. They said that stagflation cannot happen, that you cannot have recession combined with inflation. So Lucas himself made a dramatically wrong prediction. He said that the problem of recession prevention has been solved and now we will not have any more recessions. In 2003 and in 2007, you had this global financial crisis which took everyone by surprise. So Lucas Sargent said about Keynesian macroeconomics that the economic theory made predictions which were wildly incorrect and the doctrine uh, on which they were based is fundamentally flawed and now we should sort through the wreckage. This is what Lucas and Sargent said about Keynes in 1979. So he said exactly these words can be said about the Lucas Sargent program that the predictions that it made were wildly inaccurate and the theory is fundamentally flawed and now we have to sort through the wreckage. And that's what MMT is doing. We are sorting through the wreckage and we are get coming up with a new theory which is better than Keynesian theory and better than this DSG models. And it incorporates some very crucial features which have not been taken into account before. So the last thing he says, uh, Paul Romer, is that uh, why yani, he is taking a, a, a stance that all of this is garbage. A lot of people had made make criticisms. You can find them that DSG model have this thing wrong, that thing wrong, but ultimately they say we can fix these problems. And he is saying no, this, this is all garbage, it has to be thrown. So why, why am I taking this extreme position? He says that in the academia the pressure of the peers is too much, you cannot make extreme statements and this is absolutely true that if you uh, deviate too far from the uh, orthodox ideology, you will be shunned. Just we saw Card Kruger, they, they got uh, ostracized, they lost friends and uh, similarly there's lots of you know, personal interaction. So basically he says now that I'm out of the academia, I'm in the real world, I'm at the World Bank, I don't have these pressures, I don't need to publish more papers, I don't need to have uh, my papers at conferences. So I can say these things but within the academia people cannot say these things. And he says that if you have to choose between betraying science and betraying a friend, uh, Romer was actually a student of Lucas. So it's actually, um, he was um, accused of betraying his uh, teachers and mentors. So he said that in the cause of science I can betray them. <laughs>